Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the webinar, It's an Agile World, Requirements at the Speed of Thought. Today's featured speakers are Joy Beatty, the Vice President of C-Level, and Candice Hokinson, the Senior Product Manager at C-Level. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. So please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the feature, question feature of the GoToWebinar software. And today I'd like to say thank you to IREB, International Requirements Engineering Board, for sponsoring today's event. And I'd like to say to introduce Stefan Sturm, the Managing Director from IREB, to say a few words before we get started. Stefan? Yeah, thanks a lot, Tracy. Um, welcome everybody to this webinar. My name is Stefan Sturm. I'm the Managing Director of the IREP International Requirements Engineering Board from Germany. And we are thrilled to um, uh, sponsor this uh, webinar about this important topic. Um, requirements engineering in an agile context is a very, um, very difficult thing and I think um, um, Joy will give and, and Candace will give us a, a good insight how to deal with that. Um, the CPRE is a worldwide um, established um, certification scheme in requirements engineering. We deal a lot with elicitation, consolidation, modeling and management of requirements and we will have as well a certification in agile requirements engineering. I will uh, point to that at the very end of the presentation and I would like to hand over now to Joy Beatty to um, start with the webinar. Joy, the stage is yours. Thanks, Stefan, and thank you everyone who has joined us here today uh, from wherever you are in the world. Uh, Candace and I join you from Austin, Texas, actually, where it's nice and sunny out. Uh, the um, quick thing before I dive into content here, I will mention that uh, if you have not heard of IREB or even looked at it, go take a look at it. They have done some really cool things and, and are doing that much more right now. So I'm pretty excited to see the influence that they're having in the requirements world. So, um, okay, this is like up on the screen, quick glance at Candace and I and who we are. I am by no means going to read this to you and bore you with that. If you want to know more about us, you are welcome to look us up. Both of us are going to be on LinkedIn. And at the e end of the presentation, uh, we'll share our email addresses and how to find us in social media. So you are certainly welcome to learn more about us there. But with that, I'd rather just get into the content straight away. Uh, so this is blue. Uh, if any of you have ever been in any C-level presentations before or our training courses before, blue is a friend. He comes with us everywhere. Uh, and he's kind of the basis for a lot of the stories from which we talk from. So Blue is a business analyst in this particular case, and he has worked on traditional project uh, methodologies for about 15 years. He's got that waterfall approach down. He knows it inside and out as a BA. He knows what to do. Okay? He's really proud of what he's done with his career and where he's at. Then along comes the new CIO in his organization, and that CIO has decided it's time to try some Agile methods in all their projects. And Blue is like, whoa, hold on, wait a minute. He panics. Um, he's heard about Agile. Certainly, you know, maybe he has some friends who have done it in other organizations. Maybe he's read a little bit. But frankly, he doesn't really know what it means for him. Does he even have a job anymore as a business analyst? Um, let's say he does. How does he adapt the practices that he's been using for 15 years that he feels like he's perfected? How does he translate those into an agile world? So today we're going to see if we can help Blue accomplish all of that. Now in the spirit of being agile, we're going to do a poll here. Okay? Uh, what I would like to do is have you all vote what is most important for us to talk about today. And Candace and I are going to try to, on the spot, emphasize things more so than others based on what you all think is the most interesting of topics here. These are a couple topics. You may actually have another topic that's not in our list here. If you can put that in the chat question box, we'll pick those up. Uh, and that's a great way to also preload if there's certain hot topics for you. If we don't hit it, we'll hit it in the Q&A at the end. So feel free to start committing other topics in that question box right now even. So let's see. We've got, I'm just going to kind of give you some live results coming in right now. Almost nobody cares about why Agile. There's a, there's a few of you out there who care. So 
we won't spend much time on that. Um, <laughs> overview of what Agile is, a um, little bit of interest there, but the bulk of the interest is right now landing in the BA priorities in Agile, which isn't surprising, that's probably why you came. Uh, practical tips for BAs came right behind it, right before in that is sort of uh, the transitioning to Agile topics. So, okay, fantastic. Thank you, Tracy, that's good. That gives us a little bit of idea that we wanna spend the bulk of our time in the middle of our agenda. So let me flip and show you the agenda. This is what we're going to talk about today. So very, very quickly, I will touch on the why we need a new approach. Why is Agile taking off? Um, and then Candace and I are going to hand this back and forth throughout the day, but we'll cover what is Agile in general, what's the philosophy behind it. Then we'll get into what does it mean for a BA in Agile, and what are the things that I can use on my project every day. Uh, and I'll end with a little bit on how do we make that transition to an Agile approach. So, getting right into it, why do we need this, this new thing called Agile, and I say new in quotes because it's actually not that new, but new to some of us, right? Well, Agile approaches, they're becoming more and more popular, I would say, every year. We're seeing um, an increase in the numbers of our customers that are either using Agile or even the numbers of projects within a given organization that are using Agile. Um, and, and there's lots of different methods, and we'll talk about those briefly in a bit, but but why is this? Why the new methods? Why aren't we just doing things the way we always have? Well, the reality is the old ways don't work, okay? There's a famous Standish Group study that I think many of you have probably heard about. It's even controversial in some ways. Um, but nonetheless, what it shows and what I would say anecdotally I've experienced in organizations is that most projects fail. And the main reasons that projects are failing are shown here. Uh, there we go. Um, these are like kind of the top reasons that projects fail. And when I look at these, right, lack of user input, changing requirements, incomplete requirements, unclear objectives, those are business objectives, business goals, what that tells me, that whole group of topics right there, is that there's something very broken in the relationship between our business stakeholders and IT. To me, that's where things are falling apart. So given that we have delivery problems, and we know that there's something broken between that business and IT relationship, Right? That tells us there's something wrong with how we're running our projects and something has to change. And frankly, maybe it is our delivery methodology. And that's kind of where Agile has borne out of, I think, this, this popularity around it. So let's talk for a moment about waterfall, what I've called the villain here. So the waterfall approach or methodology is that sequential phase-based approach, the phases are, you know, you may call them different things, but things like requirements, design, implementation, uh, or build, verification, maintenance. And you don't really move from one phase to the next until the one that you're in is done, right? So you, in theory here, are gonna specify up front what you need, then you do the design on it, then you write the code based on that design, and then you test the code. So in theory, you can find the requirements flaws early in design before you really get down the stream into that build or that coding phase. And if you can get the requirements exactly right up front, this approach actually works really well. But there's a giant if in what I just said, because the reality is you can't get the requirements right up front. The other thing I want to say here, um, when I'm talking about waterfall as the villain, is that very few projects actually deploy a pure waterfall approach anymore. There are some, and, and certainly different industries, I would say, do this more than others. Um, in fact, if you go back to the, the person who is originally credited with defining waterfall, though he didn't actually call it that, his name's Winston Royce. He published an article in 1970, uh, and he described this sequential approach right here. What is really interesting and even almost ironic is that in that paper, Royce is presenting this model as an example of a flawed, non-working model. So he put this idea out there and said, oh, but it doesn't work. But what's interesting is that a lot of people in the industry didn't get that far in the paper. I don't even know what happened there, but it, it, they didn't get that. They thought, oh, this actually could work, and then have gone on to, to roll it out across, um, well, across the world in many different organizations. So anyway, what I would say is all those reasons that I talked about projects fail, I think, are more likely to happen if you're in a waterfall model approach because inherently in this, the business doesn't know what they want um, up front. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So large projects that 
Oh dear. Something just went wrong with our slides, guys. Sorry. No idea what just happened there. So I'm going to back up and keep talking for a minute. Um, large projects um, that use a waterfall approach are what I find typically are going to be delivered late, they lack the necessary features, and they fail to meet users' ex expectations. Okay? So that's kind of an assertion I'm making out there. Certainly I'm not saying there's not exceptions. You can be successful with waterfall. That's a generalization, but I think a fair generalization. Uh, and I welcome comments in the box if you disagree with that. So uh, when we talk about the limitations of waterfall and what we need to address in Agile, well, requirements and waterfall methodologies are used to communicate um, over these sort of artificially erected barriers between users and developers, okay? So the requirements are kind of tossed over a wall from that customer to development. Uh, requirements become more of a barrier rather than a tool to facilitate coordination. So requirements do change. Even the business objectives sometimes change, and projects need to be able to adapt to that change. Uh, but the complex dependencies that develop in a waterfall project all the way from requirements designed down to code make those inevitable changes very, very hard to deal with, right? And if you're in a waterfall approach, you probably know this, you end up with some pretty formal change control processes to deal with that, but it becomes really expensive. And in fact, errors in requirements aren't typically caught until late in the project during testing. It is so expensive, and it could be anywhere from 10 to 100 times more expensive to catch it later in there. So it's better. Um, I actually will pose the question and then answer it. Is it better to realize that you, um, imagine this picture, I'm trying to get to the product on the right. Is it better to realize that I needed that final product on the right after I built the one on the left first, or is it better to iterate on early drafts and figure it out faster, right? It's a bit of a rhetorical question, obviously. Um, large projects that use a waterfall approach are often delivered late. They, they don't deliver the features they need. They fail to meet users' expectations. Um, stakeholders often change the requirements during the course of a long project, and projects struggle when the software development teams can't respond to these changes effectively, right? So you may have stakeholders who thought they needed a blue rectangular shape, but somewhere in the middle of it thought, oh, no, wait, no, it needs to be purple. And then, you know, as the project progressed, realized, wow, we really just need a pink cylinder, right? That's normal. That's normal behavior. They're not bad people. So the reality is stakeholders will change their requirements because they don't know what they need at the beginning of the project because sometimes they can't articulate their vision until only after they've seen something that isn't going to match their vision. Um, and sometimes it's just frank, you know, the business needs to change. Like the world is changing really rapidly, so the business changes and therefore the stakeholders will change their mind. So I, my point here is to stress that that is all very normal, so let's not get upset about it. Let's instead use approaches that help us deal with that and still, you know, or more often deliver successful projects. Okay, so with that, I'm going to actually hand this off to Candice uh, for her to do a little bit more on Agile philosophy. Thanks, Joy. So we talked a little bit about why we need a new approach and why Waterfall doesn't always work. It can work. Um, but why Agile? How did it come about? So to do that, we need to go back in time a little bit. So to answer all the problems that people saw in projects, Agile approaches started to just pop up. Right? Most of these were people in their own silos, experimenting and figuring out new ways to deliver these projects. In 2001, however, 17 or so of them got together and were like, hey, we're all doing things that are kind of similar. You know, what does this mean? This is kind of where we get the Agile manifesto. and the go-to source for what it means to be Agile, in quotes there. So I'm going to read it here because I think it's always important to go over it. So the Agile Manifesto states that we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. However, so notice I emphasize the over, there is value on the items on the right, but we value the items on the left more. This sometimes gets lost, as everybody wants to be agile, everybody wants to get things out faster. We can't just throw out the baby with the bathwater and ignore all the things on the right. We just want to emphasize the things on the left because that allows us to have that collaboration and get products out faster that will meet our customers' needs. So we do need to make sure we have a little bit of process or maybe a little bit of documentation rather than just throwing everything out. 
So what happened before 2001, before the Agile Manifesto? These methods aren't necessarily new, and there's not just one Agile approach. This slide here just shows a few of the many flavors of Agile development that we see out there. Some of the notable ones, Scrum, Extreme Programming, Crystal Clear, Dynamic Systems Development Method. These are some of the more common ones we see today, but honestly, we're seeing new ones pop up every single year. And the takeaway from this slide here is that there hasn't ever been, and there isn't today, one single standard flavor of being Agile. Organizations and individuals will take those core principles that we saw in the Agile Manifesto, maybe take tools or processes from many different flavors of Agile development, and then adapt and apply those to their own unique environments. And it's one of the key benefits to being Agile, is that it prompts us to think, inspect, and adapt, and make sure that we're actually always doing things that are really useful to our customers. Currently, we're seeing Scrum more than anything else, but even that's starting to change. So now, you know, we have the high level, we know what the Agile Manifesto is. What does this actually look like when we're developing? So one of the main things here is that Agile is iterative and incremental. So usually you'll hear either sprints or iterations, and in this, they break down the development and the testing and all things around our development methodology into that iter iteration, increment, and sprint. So usually these last from one to four weeks, a very common number is two weeks. But in each iteration, we, the customer prioritizes what he wants the team to work on, the functionality is developed, it is tested, and they validate with the customer that it actually met his needs. And if it didn't, things go back into the backlog, we'll talk about that in a minute, and we do this again in the next iteration. The idea is that every single thing we build, every increment, either enriches the product, adds to the product, or corrects something between what we built before if it didn't quite match the customer's needs. And with this, we get away from the big bang deployments because at the start of the project, we know the least amount about what the customer is going to want. So by allowing us to have ongoing customer participation and building incrementally, we get to incorporate that feedback faster and correct course to adjust and build a better product for our customers. And hopefully land right on target. That's just a high level of what the Agile philosophy is. Since I know we want to focus on the core Agile concepts and how do we change as BAs, for that I'll pass it back over to Joy. Great, thanks Candace. So I think to talk about what BAs do in Agile, we need to start with talking about requirements and what that even means in the Agile world. So let's, uh, let's all align on a definition here on what we mean by this. Um, so what's a requirement in Agile? So this is the definition right out of CMMI, and there's many out there, right? IEEE has a definition, IABA has a definition, PMI has a definition, pick your definition, right? So this is what a typical waterfall-like definition of requirement looks like. Uh, frankly, that is a lot of boring text, and while the content is correct, I would say its presentation maybe is a little bit lacking. So that's kind of how I feel about that definition. <laughs> uh, so just kidding, what I'd rather do is um, drop that formality for today, for what we're talking about here. This is a definition I think we can all agree on, regardless of the approach we're using, that at the end of the day, requirements are anything that the business needs to have implemented in the solution, okay? So there's the concept of need in there, and, and every, I, I feel like we could probably have an hour-long debate, all of us together, even longer, about what at whether this is exactly right or not, but the essences of it I think we can, can at least agree on. So with that, let me jump into um, user stories, because on user stories, um, as employed as sort of an agile project, a user story really serves as a placeholder for future conversations that have to take place in a just-in-time just basis, right? And those conversations are going to be between your developers, your customer representatives, your business analysts, um, product owners, product managers, those types of roles. And those conversations ultimately reveal that additional information that developers have to know so they can implement the story. Now, uh, rather than specifying the functional requirements, um, I find that Agile teams tend to usually elaborate a refined user story into a set of acceptance tests or acceptance criteria that collectively describe the story's conditions of satisfaction. All right, so instead of functional requirements, what I'm saying is they use those acceptance tests or acceptance criteria. Okay, so thinking about tests at this early stage, um, I think, frankly, is an excellent idea for all projects, regardless of your development approach. And in fact, when I see it used in a waterfall approach, I think it's quite successful. That, that I'm getting my head around how would I test this requirement really early on. 
Um, unlike a use case, if you're familiar with those, a user story doesn't really describe the interactions between the user and the system. It doesn't go into that level of depth. Um, that said, I think a user story in this format provides an advantage over traditional use cases because what I see a lot of teams do when they're using use cases in Waterfall is they don't, they start off by naming the use cases. Um, and they don't necessarily write all those details yet, but they use those names to help start prioritizing the use cases. Um, but the difference here is that user stories include really what the user class is, um, you know, who's, what type of user, and then also, more importantly, that rationale behind the request for that system capability. And these are hugely valuable uh, additions. And in fact, if you're in an approach that uses use cases, I would encourage you to make sure that you're defining that user class, that you're defining the rationale behind the use cases, um, either in the name or just in some early fields on the use case. So a little side note there for if you're in the use case world still. So requirements in Agile projects are typically written in this user story format. Um, and they can be done on note cards. They're called story cards. Uh, or more commonly, you could use do, do them in any other tool. There are actually a lot of Agile tools on the market that support doing this very cleanly. And requirements management tools, for the most part, all now support this. Um, and many have actually adapted templates uh, to the Agile space, which is fantastic. Um, user stories are written anyway whether you put them on a note card or in a tool or in a document, they're going to be written in the format uh, up here, which is as a blank, which is your role or your user type, I want some action um, so that, and then that last bit is going to be the benefit. Stories typically have um, a brief description of the story. They have a conversation that provides a little bit more information about the story. And then they have acceptance criteria um, that are the expected test results for running that story. So that's, again, kind of on the back of the card if you're using the traditional story card method. Uh, what I will say, first of all, by the way, I don't really see companies use story cards all that often anymore, maybe in a brainstorming session, but longer term, they tend to end up in a tool. Um, there's kind of the classic story about if you use, like, sticky notes as your cards and tack them to a wall, somebody walks by, the cards start to trickle down. So I don't recommend that particular approach, but not to say no one does it, I just think it's risky. Anyway, um, either way, one thing to be careful about, in some organizations, um, user stories have become the requirements, and this is the only way that they accept that you write requirements. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can supplement user stories with more than just text. Um, what I will say is you will never hear me or Candace tell you that the only way to write requirements is user stories, even in an agile world. Um, and so we're going to get into some of that here in a minute in a little more practical sense. I want to jump back here to the use case versus use story thing, because I think there's a mystique around uh, use cases and another round, one around stories. Um, interestingly, they're actually not that different. Um, so at a high level, use cases, I mean, they really look a lot like user stories. Both are going to be focused on understanding what different types of users need to accomplish with their interactions with the software system. Like fundamentally, that's what use cases and user stories are. So they're actually not that different. Um, what I will say is that the two processes um, branch, let me actually just expand the screen for you, they move in different directions from that sort of starting point where we've really understood, you know, what does the user need to accomplish? Use cases, the next step is the BA is going to work on um, the, how do they expect the interaction to go between the user and the system, so they get into a lot more detail very quickly about that interaction. Um, usually it shows up in the use case steps and then functional requirements, right? With the user story, again, it's more about having a conversation to flesh out the details of that story uh, so that just enough details are available that it can be developed in whatever type of iterations. Uh, and I will point out that in this diagram, you'll see acceptance tests can be used both for user stories and use cases. Um, in the user story world, often those acceptance tests, again, represent the equivalent of like a functional requirement. So this, I think, is important if you're in a traditional approach and moving towards a more waterfall approach to understand that maybe some of what you've used isn't that far off of where you need to go. All right, in uh, Agile, we have a thing called product backlogs. These are typically composed of user stories. 
Um, some approaches will populate that backlog with something else, maybe requests, requirements, business processes, defects. All those things could end up in a product backlog. Um, the way to think about it is the things that go in the product backlog are all of the things that the business thinks they need in the product at some point, one way or another. Uh, so this is really all the possible work that the development team could end up needing to do. And in fact, the development team could put stories in the backlog, um, technical stories or something, technical spikes, you'll hear these things. Um, and as I mentioned, even defects can go in with user stories because at the end of the day, you need to maybe prioritize defects against, like fixing defects against doing new features. Um, and so if you have them all in one place, you can do that. Now, prioritization of the backlog is really key in Agile. Uh, I, I did see a question come in around this, like prioritizing that backlog, so we'll try and address that at the end. But uh, the point of prioritization in backlogs in Agile is that you're going to be doing it continuously throughout the project. At any point, things can come into the backlog, and you need to be prioritizing against what's already in there. Prioritizations can shift in that backlog as the project goes on. Uh, really, as long as the development team is not working on something, the priority of it could change. Um, now, obviously, if something's already been slotted to be developed in an upcoming iteration, we don't want to mess with that. It's the things after that we could change at any point in time. So here's a quick look at the Agile life cycle. Uh, so for each sprint or iteration, you may call them different things depending on your approach, a small group of user stories are going to be selected from the backlog. Um, that's what the development team is going to work on. They take the stories that are selected and they create what they call a sprint backlog. That sprint backlog contains all the tasks that need to be done during that sprint. Okay? This is not just development tasks. It includes things like test tasks or any other necessary tasks to complete a particular story. We typically see sprints are anywhere from two to four weeks in duration. They could be shorter, they could be longer. Really depends again on your organization um, and where you're at uh, in terms of maturity even to some degree or what types of projects you're doing. All right, there are short daily meetings that we like to hold with the development team. Um, so we're in constant communication is the idea. The whole team is frequently talking about what was done yesterday, what's the plan for today, what blocks do we have from getting through our plan today. Um, at the end of each of our iterations, the development team will hold a product demonstration uh, with your key business stakeholders so they can see what's going on. This is a huge change, by the way, for business stakeholders, the idea that they are constantly getting to see the product um, in development. And, and I will tell you that takes a cultural shift in their mind. Um, so don't expect that to happen overnight, right? And anyway, that cycle I've described repeats over and over again until the project ends, which could be when the backlog is cleared, it could be when you run out of time, it could be when you run out of budget, it could be the business decides at one point, oh, that's enough product, I like what it is, let's just stop there and, and be done. Um, most frequently it's because time ran out or budget ran out, right? But again, that's just a really quick high-level view of the Agile process. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Candace now to talk through a little bit more on sort of that, actually quite a bit more on the VA um, things that we do in Agile projects. Thanks, Joy. So again, we've learned a little bit about what do I need to know as a VA. Now, what do I do? So I'm going to, there's several slides here on some tips and we'll spend a little bit of time on each. The first thing to know, just as I mentioned before, is that we're not just going to throw out everything we knew before. Our traditional skills, everything we learned as business analysts are still prevalent and are still needed on Agile projects. The skills required by the team as a whole stays the same. The roles may have a different makeup or a different name, but we still need project management. We still need analysis. So most project, Agile projects have a product owner or product champion. This person could come from the business um, and a lot of times does because they can have that prioritization. They know innately what they want in the product. They own the requirements and they own the backlog, but they may not have the analysis skills to break down stories into a single sprint, to understand really the level of detail that's needed for the development team to go and build what they're asking for. So a lot of times you'll still need someone with good business analysis skills involved on the project. This could be the product owner themselves if the product owner comes from IT. This could be a PO with a BA supporting them. This could be a, a product owner that gives proxy power, so to speak, to the BA. Uh, I see this a lot, especially on distributed teams. Right? If the product owner is not necessarily co-located with the development team, but the business analyst is, they'll get proxy power during their time zone to answer questions and make on-the-spot decisions for the product owner. 
and our names change, right? Maybe BAs aren't called BAs anymore. They may just be product owners, product managers. I've seen many different ways they call this. Obviously, project managers could become Scrum Masters or stay project managers. But just because they have a different name or the skills are cut up, sliced and diced in a different way, they're still the same skills that we need to know. You might learn some new skills too. One of the main ones is how to slice the work so that developers can do a finished thing in a sprint. So we'll talk a little bit about this um, when we get to the level of detail and visual models as well. But the idea here is you might have to get a little creative sometimes right, on what is a thing that can be shown. Uh, I've seen everything from database tables, they're not very fun to look at the review, but it is something that can be completed and shown to the stakeholder. So those requirements, call them user stories, call them functional requirements, whatever you'd like. But the requirements activities, what we need to do to be able to get a story ready for development remains the same, regardless of the methodology. For every single story or requirement that we do, we have to elicit the information from someone. We need to specify it in a way that it can be consumed. We have to analyze it to make sure we didn't miss anything. And we need to validate that this is actually the right thing to build and the right way to build it. The main thing that changes here is the timing. So in Waterfall, you saw the, the phases, right? We do all the requirements up front, we design, and we build. In Agile, we do these in slices, right? In iterations or sprints. So we do a little bit up front, maybe a sprint zero or a planning phase to get maybe a high-level list, a starting list of user stories in the backlog. Then as each sprint, we can either look out or look at the sprint in hand and say, hey, let's specify, let's get down into more detailed. That's when we define our acceptance criteria. What's it actually going to look like to accept this user story? And there are lots of ways that the teams can agree on doing this. The business analyst, the product owner, and the team need to agree, how is the, the BA going to work with the team? Right? We may decide that we're going to do our business analysis at the very beginning of each sprint so that we really do leave it to the last responsible moment. Or if you have a lot of dependencies or a lot of uh, other teams that you have to work with, the BA may work one to two sprints ahead of the development team. So they can identify those dependencies and work with those teams to get the user stories in their backlogs. But regardless of which approach, the BA PO is going to be writing these user stories and writing these requirements up until we release the final product. This diagram just shows the stories. You can have anything in your backlog, as we saw in the slide. These could be defects or you know, requests, features, anything like that. One interesting tidbit uh, we've learned over our course of doing these Agile projects is on average, you're probably looking at six weeks for a, the life cycle of a requirement. Now, that's not six weeks that it's in the backlog necessarily before it can be built, but from inception of, hey, we want to ask for this, to actually getting the information, to refining it with the dev team and actually delivering it is on average about six weeks. Okay, this was a big one. <laughs> so there is a kind of principle in Agile, but we want to create the minimum level of documentation. We went from waterfall with these big, thick documents of uh, requirements and specifications that detailed out every single thing for the developers to build. We want to get away from that because we want the developers to give input to the process and help us make those design decisions because as the BA or the product owner, we're not necessarily the right ones to make those decisions. But this doesn't mean no documentation. All right, and this is where the BA really comes in handy on a team, is helping the team understand what is that minimum level of documentation to, to create that shared level of understanding but not go too far. So a lot of times teams will begin to view communication and information sharing as documentation. But that's not true. You need to collaborate. You need to communicate. In Agile, sometimes even more than in Waterfall. So we have to help them understand that, yes, sometimes you just really have to write things down. <laughs> we can't keep track of everything. We don't know every decision that was made in every meeting unless we document some of that. So generally speaking, our requirements on Agile projects will be documented in less detail, um, but not none. So this may mean that you have visual models to your user stories. You may have more collaborative working sessions. Uh, you may have prototypes or UI mockups to share that, have that shared collaborative understanding. Regardless, we do need to have something either as placeholders or as our final documentation of what needs to be built and how we can do that. One tool or one way in your toolbox to help with that minimum documentation is visual models. Visual models are thing, a way to show information to get quick understanding with the team. So they help us supplement our user stories. For example, 
in this jumble of letters, <laughs> we have to find the missing letter. Right? With, with it like this, it's all a jumble. Now I realize that the alphabet is an ordered list, so you could walk through and figure it out. But imagine it's not an ordered list. Our visual models, if we apply structure to this jumble of letters, it's a lot easier to find the missing letter, the E. One of the things we always say is that pictures are easy and words are hard. Visual models are very useful in our waterfall approaches. They help us find holes and do our analysis to make sure we're not missing requirements up front. But they're just as good in an agile environment because a lot of times they're a lot easier and quicker to make than writing down requirements. They're easy to share and get that understanding. And you can throw them away, right? If you, you can do low tech on a whiteboard or a quick Visio document, and as soon as you get that communication, it doesn't have to be an ever-living document. It can be if, if the team decides it needs to be. But once its purpose is served and we get to that requirement we do our build, you don't necessarily need to keep it up to date. So visual models can really help us get that next level of understanding with the team, making sure we're all on the same page of, hey, this is what we discussed. Is everyone in agreement? I actually just recently did this on a project. We were doing a, we have to check for duplicate applications in a credit process. And there was a disconnect. I was the PO. I have a BA working with me. There was a disconnect between the design of what the solution architect and what our BA had thought. And we talked about it. We had meetings. We had emails. And finally, I was like, let me just put this in a system flow. Let's show every step that, my, uh, that the system does to check for a duplicate and what it does after each step. I created it. The BA is like, well, this isn't what I thought we were doing, but great. This looks like a great approach. Let's go with it. And the solution architect was, this is exactly what I thought. So those visual models can help. You're probably not going to use quite as many visual models on an Agile project as you might on a traditional waterfall project, and you'll do them at different times in the project. You may do a business objectives model to understand the high-level objectives early on, maybe a feature tree to start the scope. And then as you get into the project, more process flows, um, decision trees or decision uh, tables if you need to detail out logic. So you can do those on a just-in-time basis. Another thing, uh, this one might seem a little self-evident, but is always good to call out, you have to collaborate. One of the underlying principles outside of the you know, four main statements, so those four statements in the Agile Manifesto are underlined by 12 principles. And one of them is that the development team and the business need to collaborate every day. So collaboration is important in all methodologies. If you're going to build something, you need to collaborate with people. But the collaboration is a little different in an Agile world. In the waterfall world, you might have a lot of heavy involvement with the stakeholders up front, and then they go away for a little while, maybe they get some questions asked, but usually they're kind of MIA, or missing in action, until the end of the project for testing. On an Agile project, it's a lot more even keel. So every sprint or iteration, the business stakeholder needs to be involved, answering questions, attending the sprint demos or reviews to say, yes, this is what I was expecting, this meets my needs. So we need to have that collaboration. And it's not just with the business stakeholders. The developers need to collaborate with each other. We need to collaborate with the PO and the team. There's also other teams, right? especially if you're doing design and dependencies. One of the things I saw a question pop up, and we can talk about it in more depth in the Q&A, but some of the biggest ways I've seen Agile projects fail is they get so just in time that they forget about their dependencies. They forget to talk to the team over in the next building about what they need to change as well. So that collaboration, that communication is just as important. A few more here, uh, tips and tricks. One of the biggest things that we need to talk about is change. Joy mentioned this, right? Change always happens, even on a waterfall project. But in a waterfall project, we pay for change by change control processes and the pain of trying to get something reprioritized. The Agile philosophy says change is going to happen. Let's just embrace it. Let's know we're not going to get everything right up front and build the change into the process. So as a BA, we might sometimes need to change our mindset of saying, no, that's out, that's out of scope, to, hey, let's see where this fits. Everything is in scope. It's all about priorities. So the business stakeholders can and will have a wish list a mile long. And then it's all about working with the business stakeholders or the customers as the PO or BA and say, what is most important? Because likely we don't have unlimited time and we don't have unlimited budget, so we're not going to be able to build everything. What is most important? What brings the most business value or customer satisfaction? And let's build that first. The interesting thing about this is you're going to be just as likely to cut things from scope. 
you'll have a list of things that say, hey, we thought we needed this. We get further down the cycle and say, ah, actually, we don't really need that anymore. Let's take it out of the backlog. And part of the PO's job, and the BA helping him or her, is to keep that backlog healthy and clean. So we drop those things that we don't need anymore. We don't keep user stories in a backlog indefinitely. We routinely go through and say, do we need this? And if not, it gets dropped. Now, knowing this, knowing change happens, it doesn't mean we can't look ahead or plan ahead. We need to be able to see the future a little bit. We don't need to know exactly what it looks like, but if we have big things like architectural improvements or architectural changes, we need to start planning for those a little more in advance than maybe a quick feature upgrade. So we need to tell the team about that. That may, may mean that they need more technical stories or more technical uh, research in order to get us to that end goal with the features. There are a few areas uh, other than architectural that we find cause significant issues or rework if we don't look at them ahead of time. So I'm just going to give you a quick list. One thing is things like security or access control. You don't have to have everything defined up front, but if you know you're going to have security or roles-based access, you want to at least start bringing that up early because it plays a role in how they design the system and how the developers build the system. Internationalization is another huge thing. If you're building something for just one region or just one country, it can be easy to hard code things in and not make it flexible and scalable to that international scale. Compliance, regulatory, and legal is huge. Um, and this is another area we've seen a lot of agile processes fail, um, is figuring out how to work with compliance or legal uh, rules. So especially when you're working, say, in the financial industry where you have to have, say, full regression testing and show, prove that every single thing will work all the time, you can get into trouble if you don't work that out with the Agile process or build in those automated tests to handle that. A few more. Uh, another big one is performance, scalability, and reliability. So all of those non-functional requirements in the waterfall world, they're just as important in Agile, but it's a little hard to build a user story for them. So we've seen non-functional requirements happen, and yet we're still on the change happens for someone who put that question. <laughs> A lot of those non-functional requirements, we see them in a few ways. If it's a non-functional or performance requirement around a specific story, it just becomes an acceptance test of that story, right? So a screen loading in a certain speed or being able to hold, uh, handle so many users. Other ways you can do this if it's a larger non-functional requirement, so uptime, um, portability, all of those things. It can either be a user story or an epic that gets built incrementally as we go along or it can be part of the definition of done, right? So we didn't, we're not going to talk a lot about definition of done here, but definition of done is a way that we know that the development team is done with a story or any level of the project. The story is most common and it gets reviewed at every review, but there's also definitions of done for a sprint. Did we think about our non-functional requirements? And a release. So this could be something that before we release to production, we check off, hey, we had this definition of done that we need to meet, this uptime, this, this scalability, and this, these performance requirements. Did we meet them? And if the answer is no, we don't go to production. We have to have another sprint to fix the, the issues. Last one on this slide is multi-platform. So if we're going to be on multiple platforms and we need the, the ability to move between them, we need to think about that ahead of time. Last tip is how do we practically manage that change? So we talked about change happens. <laughs> and that change will happen. So how do we manage it? How does the PO or BA manage it? So let's take a look at our backlog. Our backlog looks like this rectangle. We'll have things that we're building in the current iteration. Developers are building this right now. If this happens, we don't really want to change what the developers are building right now. Right? We want to leave it into the future. So the PO really has control over the next iteration and everything else. Once the team has taken it into the sprint, the PO should usually just leave it alone unless something drastic happens. So then we have the next iteration that should be fairly well known and well defined for the team to pick it up. And then everything else, everything in the future iterations. Well, we're always going to be getting new requests, tasks, defects coming into this backlog. For example, we may have one that came in, two came in today. Well, the PO or BA would work with the business stakeholder or customers and say, well, where does this fit? Well, we may find out, well, this one's pretty high priority, so we need to build it next. Maybe it's a defect that we need to fix right away. And this other one's kind of a nice to have. We'll put it further down. Well, in order to manage this, especially in this next iteration phase, if we're putting something in right away, we need to move something out. Our dev team's ability to build things is finite. So to do this, we may just take out a requirement 
completely if it's not useful anymore, but then we can move things around. The backlog is always a stack ranked list of what we need to build. Now it doesn't usually matter if it's exactly right stack ranking as long as the next iteration and the next thing we build is always the most important thing to build. So this happens every day. We have to go in the backlog and say, okay, what makes sense? Where do we need to, do we need to move things back and forth? Do we have new requirements? Can we take out old requirements? And I find that this is one of the, the items that are probably less thought about for the role of the PO or BA when they're allocating time for a project. This cleaning and grooming, so this is one of the words I use, of the backlog takes a lot of time. I probably spend about a quarter of my time as a product owner just maintaining that backlog. That's not eliciting new requirements, it's not grooming with the team to get details, but just keeping that backlog in, in shape and making sure everything's up to date takes a lot of work. So those are all of my practical tips for now. I'm going to hand it back over to Joy uh, for a little bit on how to transition. Great. Thank you, Candice. All right. So as you're making that transition from a non-Agile to an Agile, um, these are just some suggestions I'll make. Some are probably more obvious than others. Um, first of all, you need to figure out what your role is on the team. Uh, and I say you, you as an individual, you as a business analyst, could be you as a project manager. Um, some Agile projects have a dedicated business analyst or PM for that matter, but um, others maybe roll that, I'm going to use a roll, roll twice here, roll that role into a different job title. What I mean by that is maybe the product owner is doing the business analysis work, okay? One thing I will say is um, don't get hung up on what your title is. Um, I care more about focus on the goal of what you're trying to get done. Someone needs to be doing good business analysis in Agile. And again, I don't really care what the job title is called, but somebody has to be doing this. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, in the Q&A box uh, at some point was around, you know, who does the BA job? And, and, and that answer will vary by organization from one to another. Um, I have seen organizations that have a product owner, a product manager, and a business analyst, and they each have different things that they do within the same project. Sometimes it's the product owner that does it all. Uh, sometimes the business analyst becomes the product owner. There are agile purists out there that will tell you that is a very bad idea that, that POs should come from the business. Well, the business has to do their day job, so sometimes they can't commit to being a full-time product owner. Um, and so a BA actually can represent them really well if they know it inside and out. Um, and so they're talking to that business representative all the time, but at the end of the day, the BA is actually uh, enabled to make things like prioritization decisions. So that's going to be really different organization to organization. Um, but again, just make sure somebody's doing the role one way or another. Also, figure out which agile practices work best in your organization. Notice what works today and carry it forward as you transition to agile. I will tell you there's something that baffles me. I see organizations who have really strong requirements practices. Uh, and part of what I mean by that is things like defining good business objectives, using them to prioritize, um, using visual models. Like We are huge fans of visual modeling in requirements because you can't just do it in text, right? Like Candace said, pictures are easy, words are hard. Um, but I see them do it. When they trans transition to Agile, it's like they forgot all of that and they move into this user story world that's all text. That doesn't work, right? All the stuff that you used to do, you need to be able to carry that forward and figure out how to make it work in Agile. And it does work in Agile. Uh, another idea is to encourage people to implement maybe a small project first as a pilot and then roll it out to more. Um, or maybe implement only a few of the Agile practices on your next project, right? You don't have to go full on. This is an important one. Don't be Agile purists just for the sake of being a purist, okay? Um, that kind of attitude just annoys everybody else on the team is what I found, right? A hybrid approach in the organization might be fine. Uh, maybe it's a step on the way to being uh, more, I don't even know what pure Agile means, but being more 100% Agile. <laughs> um, but attempting to adopt a few Agile practices, maybe these add-ins to your traditional approach, can just set you on the path um, of an, of an inefficient waterfall, or it could set you on a path of actually making something that works. So just be aware that you can be flexible in that space. And then right in the middle of this, right, you may want to find someone who can be a coach to you. It could be internal, it could be external. I don't, you know, just somebody who has had some experience with Agile that you can lean on to learn how to do the day-in, day-out Agile practices. 
All right. Um, what I will say is whatever you do, right, be agile in doing it. Don't be rigorous about, okay, this is what agile is going to look for us in six months. It may not hold true. One organization that we worked with decided to make this move from a traditional approach to an agile approach. And I'll tell you, the entire organization jumped in first. Um, the IT teams were so ecstatic about it. They went down this path. They were doing lots of really good things. What they didn't do is get the business bought in. They didn't get management bought in. And so you had managers and businesses who wanted like formal approvals, formal requirements documents. Um, net net was the whole thing started to fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, I will fast forward because it's a much more in-depth story and tell you that at some point the CIO who had mandated all projects are going to use Agile came back and, and also then mandated all projects stop using Agile. It was so bad in the rollout that he, did, he demanded no one was to use Agile anymore. And it became kind of like a bad word in that organization. So you don't want to be in that spot, right? So taking a transition approach and not just trying to go necessarily dive in where everybody does it might be a more successful approach in many organizations is what I'll say. And remember, if you've seen one Agile project, you've seen one Agile project. They all are going to look a little bit different, okay? And what works and what doesn't work. All right, that wraps up our agenda for today. Um, just a reminder, these are the topics that we started the day with. Um, I saw some comments come in from you, and a couple of them we've hit on, a couple we will hit in the Q&A. But take a moment right now. Um, I would like for you, as I put the this next slide up to start typing any additional questions you have in. We have a ton. I can already tell you we may not get through them all. Um, so a couple things here before we wrap up and get into Q&A. Number one is there's some, I, I know some people are asking for books. Here is a list of some reading that we have relied on. Um, some of our favorites is what I'll say. Uh, there's a little bit of bias in a couple of those, as you can imagine, but I'll put them out there because I think there's some good information there. Um, Second, uh, in a couple slides while we do the Q&A, Candace and I, again, will have our contact information up there, and that last URL will show up again. So you can grab something um, from that if you want. And then, so anyway, put your questions in. Don't go anywhere. What I'm going to do right now is actually hand it over to Stefan real quick one more time to remind you about I, um, IREB, and then we'll do Q&A. Okay, Stefan, up to you. Uh, thank you very much, Troy, for uh, this interesting talk, and this as well. Um, Yes, everybody, I just want to point out that um, the Agile field still needs requirements engineering, as Candace and Choi has, uh, have demonstrated. And uh, the IREP is addressing that need with a special um, certification path with the CPRE at Agile, uh, which will be launched in February next month. There will be a primer addressing the basics and giving you basic insight into the topic and on top of that there will be an advanced level module for all those who want to dive very deep into the topic and of course we have all the traditional stuff in in our um, curriculum um, with how to deal with stakeholders and all uh, the other traditional RE stuff. Okay, that's all from my side. I will hand back to Joy uh, and Candace for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Bye. Great. Thanks, Stefan. And again, just a reminder here, um, here's our email address. Candace and I both welcome you reaching out to us in email, LinkedIn, whatever works for you. And if we don't get to your question, email us because one of us would be happy to, uh, to respond to you offline if necessary. So, Candace, I'll take the first question um, uh, as I've been watching them kind of come in here. One of the things that came up was around how do we prioritize user stories in the backlog and some practical tips to do that. So, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of prioritizing anything, and I think it works really well with stories in a backlog, is to think about the business value added of the individual stories. Um, we use a model called Objective Chains. Um, if you happen to have a copy of our model's book, it's in there as its own chapter. But the idea is I have my business objectives for the project. So I know how many, like think of ROI, how many dollars am I trying to get back out of this project? Maybe it's a million dollar project. And then I can actually um, do so, and I don't have to make some assumptions to do this, but can actually start to estimate the dollar value of the individual user stories, right? So I may have some user stories that are $100,000 in value, and I have others that are $10,000 in value. So you can imagine I would implement the $100,000 ones first. 
This, of course, is glossing over dependencies and things like that. But the gist of the idea behind it is to think about how much value am I adding. And if you can't get to the level of analysis to quantify them, at least intuitively be thinking about the individual value of different things in the story. So, Candace, if you want to add to that, you can, or do you want to take the next question? I think I'll take the next question. I think you okay. covered that. Uh, so just looking through here, one of the ones that caught my eye was how detailed do you need to get with requirements in order to have the team be able to size them in grooming without getting into too much design? And that is a doozy of a question. So <laughs> mostly because the answer here is that there is no one right level of detail. Um, it really depends on the team that you're working with. If you have dependency teams that are uh, dependent on you defining and giving them information, and of course how much control, so to speak, that the business stakeholder wants over that design. I've had teams where I just give them a high level user story with a few notes and they can take it and run with it and it's great. And I'm working with a team now that I have to do detailed data mapping documents to tell them exactly which piece of data goes into which field and which piece. <laughs> so I've seen everything, every piece of that scale. And so my advice to you as the PO or BA is to find what works with the team. Sit down and have an open and candid conversation with the team about what level of detail that they want and need so that they don't get too bogged down into details, but that we don't spend too much time having to redo work because we didn't have enough detail to know what to build up front. Joy, anything else to add to that one? No, I think that was great, Candace. Thanks. Um, I, real quick before I take another question, I just put, if you haven't looked in the chat window, I've just sent out a couple links to you and I think Tracy did as well, but just real quickly, if you wanted to grab um, that product under cheat sheet, I put the link in there so you can grab it right off of that. I thought that might be easier for some people. Um, and then somebody had asked about Agile tools. Uh, what do we like to use? And it's interesting, Candace and I are big fans of modeling as we've talked about, and a lot of the Agile tools don't support doing modeling. They support um, user stories really well and development integration, but not that visual aspect of the elaborating the stories or even defining the stories. And so requirements management tools um, do that a better job at that. And I pointed you to a link if you want to grab our um, tool study results to, to learn a little bit more about what tools support that really well. Um, you're welcome to use that and change it up however is useful for your own organization. All right, sorry, so with that, let me take another one, um, unless you have one, Candace, I'll just grab one here. There's a ton of really good questions, you guys. Um, let's see, here's one about, are you saying that functional requirements become acceptance criteria? And I think this alludes to something that I was talking about earlier in the discussion. Uh, and, I, and so I want to um, be very careful about language here, and again, let's all take our purist hats off for a moment, because I know there's some people that will cringe about what I'm going to say, uh, but not us, right, in this, this group of many. Um, the idea is that the level of detail that you would go to with functional requirements and a traditional approach is very similar to the level of detail you would need to go to with acceptance criteria and an Agile approach. Okay? You may write those statements in very, very different formats. Okay? and, and Frankly, traditional formats often use system shall. I don't even love that. So I like the way that we write acceptance criteria, and I'm getting more at the level that we're talking about there is what, we, what behaviors we need to implement in the system. That's what's coming out at that level. So if you're doing user stories and acceptance criteria, you really probably do not also need to write something called functional requirements. If you're writing something that feels like functional requirements, see if you can rewrite them in a way that becomes acceptance criteria. Okay. All right, Candace, do you have one that you would like to take? Yep, this will probably be the last one, but it'll okay. see. we'll see how quickly I can answer it. Um, and this one, I, I chose this one because it speaks directly to a little metric I gave you guys. If the life cycle of a requirement is six weeks, but our iterations are two weeks, how do we maintain that flow of work? And the short answer is you just sim simply can't get everything done within a single iteration. The P somebody has to be looking ahead. Now, they don't have to be super far ahead of the team because that creates waste and potentially rework, right? So if I'm writing requirements that aren't, or user stories that won't be built for another year, that's not very useful, but I can't always be writing just the requirements or user stories for this sprint because I will eventually run out um, or I won't have enough time to actually get enough detail and that in itself will cause rework because we won't build what the customer was expecting. So usually as the PO, I like to stay about two sprints ahead and in my high level definition, I won't have all the details yet, 
But that way that gives me four weeks or so to evolve it until, before the development team takes it into the sprint. Do you have anything to add to that one? No, that was great. Uh, I think we are probably just about out of time. So at this point, like I said, there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to. I feel bad about that. Please email us. Um, don't hesitate. Don't feel like you had a bad question and we just didn't get to it. We get, ran out of time. So send us a note. Uh, if any of these links aren't working uh, for some reason for you too, we can just send you the file. So again, shoot us an email. We'll get you what you need. And with that, Tracy, I think I'm going to hand it back to you to close us out. Thank you, Joy, and thank you both to Joy and Candace for such a great webinar today. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, IREB, International Requirements Engineering Board, for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you to all of our attendees for attending today's webinar. A reminder that this webinar is being archived and will be posted on our website within two business days under modernanalyst.com slash webinars. And now this concludes today's event. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Joy and Candace. Have a great day.